Thank you for taking the time to consider our presentation. My name is Jill Taylor of Taylor Hazel Architects. We are a firm that has a specialization in the conservation of heritage properties and in, the, in assisting governments and communities review strategies for preservation of its built and cultural heritage. We have a particular specialization in the review of the province's courthouses and jails and have been involved with decision making, retrofit, and best use of planning for similar properties for over 25 years. I was very engaged by my research and findings on the history of the property as a whole. With this background, I hope that I have been able to provide the city with an understanding of its value and to assist in determining what options are available for the preservation of the courthouse within the context of the potential for keeping other portions of the former judicial precinct in order to tell the story of its cultural and architectural history. The former Gray County Courthouse, the jail, its walls and jail yards, as well as the governor's residence, form a precinct that runs from 3rd Avenue East to 4th Avenue East. The 1854 Courthouse is a city-owned property designated under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act. The city-owned jail buildings, built in three phases from 1854 to 1877, and the Governor's Residence of 1889, are listed on the Heritage Register of the City of Owen Sound, but not designated under the Ontario Heritage Act. The former North Gray Land Registry Office from 1855 is on a separate property, privately owned, and is listed on the Heritage Register of the City of Owen Sound. An adjacent building across from the courthouse and governor's residence, known as the Maitland House, is a listed property. Our heritage consulting firm was retained by the city with Heritage Structural Engineers Tacoma Engineering in order to prepare a cultural heritage evaluation report for the jail and governor's residence property with a statement of cultural heritage value for the jail buildings, to prepare a heritage impact assessment to evaluate the impact of partial or full removal of the jail and the governor's residence from the property, to prepare five options for retention, partial removal, or total removal of the jail and governor's residence with recommendations. The city is trying to determine how to manage the owned properties in a way that will allow maximum preservation to occur at the designated courthouse. Our analysis looks at five options for preservation of the courthouse in combination with the retention of some or all other listed buildings on the site. Each option is described according to its impact on the overall cultural heritage value of the site. The courthouse, jail, and governor's residence are all located on the same block and originally formed a community administrative precinct. The buildings are physically connected to each other. The front yards and vehicle entries are shared by the courthouse and governor's residence. The side yards of the courthouse and jail buildings are somewhat contiguous. The jail has high stone walls defining multiple prisoner exercise yards that are related particularly to the jail building. What looks today like a ragtag grouping of buildings was once considered one of the most important sites in the country and was the result of investment by the government of Upper Canada, as well as provincial and county governments. It was a property of distinction with a function that was key to the founding of the county and municipality, as I will briefly describe. The context for the development of the judicial precinct rests in the history of the founding of courthouses and jails, as well as registry offices across the province. To a large extent, the 19th century judicial precincts of Ontario are among its most significant cultural heritage sites and were crucial to the establishment of the counties and towns in which they were built. A history of the courthouses and jails in Ontario is included in brief in the share and HIA that we prepared that is on the city's website. In 1792, the government of Upper Canada made it mandatory that a courthouse be built in each of the province's four districts. Prior to this law, a court was held in taverns, inns, or private homes, and jailers often had to keep prisoners in their own homes. This did not change in Owen Sound until the courthouse and jail were built in the 1850s. Building a courthouse with registry office and jail 
elevated its status to those of towns like London, Cornwall, Guelph, St. Thomas, Perth, Picton, and others where justice complexes acted as civic landmarks. As shown in this image from around 1870, the evolution of the site is complex. The county courthouse facing 3rd Avenue East was built in 1854, as was the first jail, here shown in location 8. North Gray County Land Registry Office is seen at location 6, built in 1855. The stone jail and its jail yards are shown at location 1. This was built as a two-story building in 1869, and a third story was added in 1877. The governor's residence is not shown on this image and was built later in 1889. The site functioned as a courthouse, jail, administrative office, and police department until things started to change in 1960. In 1960, the court's function moved to new premises, leaving the historic courthouse vacant. The police department continued to occupy the site until 1986. The city used interim measures to occupy and preserve the courthouse through repairs and leases through an over 20-year period. But in 2011, the Ministry of Corrections vacated the jail and governor's residence, and the site has been totally vacant since that time. The physical and spatial configuration of a site can be described in the site plan. I will briefly outline some of the characteristics of the buildings on the site and will show images of the buildings as they exist today with some background history. The jail of 1854 is shown as a dark blue line, as it is a two-story stone-walled, wood-framed structure on stone foundation with gable roof. The three-story jail building of 1869 and, and 1877 is shown in red. It is a massive limestone masonry structure with window openings on four elevations. It has a hipped roof and limestone chimneys. The historic jail yards shown in green are enclosed by a mass masonry wall, by mass masonry walls of rubble with limestone coins as the corners and limestone cap. They are intact, including the 1854 jail yard, the large south and east jail yard, and the smaller east facing jail yard. The governor's residence of 1889, shown in light blue, is a two and one half story red brick building with central stair built directly adjacent to and abutting the north wall of the 1854 jail. Its interior construction is frame and um, frame floor and wall partitions. It is a highly altered and highly deteriorated building. An addition constructed during the latter part of the 20th century provided access to the 1869 to 77 jail. Attached to the governor's residence is a two-story frame garage in poor condition. The history of the early small jail behind the courthouse is fascinating. Here are some quotations about its founding. The jail and courthouse were built in 1853 and enclosed, and an attempt made to finish the inside during the winter of 1854. The jail proper was built in two L's and attached to the courthouse. The one on the north side had three cells and three debtors' rooms on the second floor. The south L was for males and had four cells and three debtors' rooms. The three cells were complete on the women's side. The cells were built of elm logs and were about eight feet by ten feet built inside stone walls. The windows were barred with four one-inch bars set in the sill and lintel with no crossbars. The 1869 jail was added to accommodate more modern practices and to improve sanitation. The new two-story jail building of 1869 comprised of cells on the ground and second floor. It was a fine building of massive local limestone blocks and its interior core was made of limestone vaults with narrow cells and perimeter circulation on three sides. By 1877, a third story of cells, identical to the second, was added to the jail, with the hipped roof and chimneys seen today. The high stone exercise yard walls, enclosing two large yards on the north and south, and one on the small yard facing East 4th Avenue East, were also built around the same time.
This is the 1854 jail seen from above. The construction contract for the courthouse and adjoining jail, shown here with Central Courtyard, was signed in 1852. While the exterior is in fair to poor condition, it is largely intact. However, only remnants remain of the 1854 interiors, which were heavily used and adapted over time, or abandoned. The original configuration of the connections between the courthouse to the left and the 1854 jail in the midground has been maintained over time. Unfortunately, the early Gray County Jail received very bad reviews from inspectors, including this report in the comment of October 11, 1860, in which it was reported, We regret to have to report the entire insufficiency of the structure for a large county with rapidly increasing population that the jail is not sufficient either in size or structure for the proper classification of prisoners or for their health or safekeeping. The grand jurors' complaints were to be a consistent theme over many years as they concerned, the, concerned themselves with the lack of sufficient supply of good water, a poorly draining jail yard, the presence of cesspools close to the back of the jail, and the insecurity of jail walls. In the comment on July 4, 1862, the government inspector of jails reported to county council about the insufficiency of the county jail and the need to do something about it. To meet the requirements of law and humanity, we inform the council that there are two very bad jails in the province and yours is one of them. We must build a new one, but up to $12,000 the government will pay only one half. The steps for improving the jail were to be more efficient drainage, a supply of good water, enlarging the prison for better security and classification of prisoners, and increasing the height of the external walls. Water could be piped in from a spring on the side of the hill east of the jail, and drainage was increased. This spurred the construction of the 1869 new stone jail. The two-story 1869 jail, and then the third-story addition of 1877, were joined to the 1854 jail, and they were contiguous, all being used by the provincial jail up to uh, 2011 with the governor's residence. The complex of buildings seen from above are clearly interrelated. Here you can see the mass of the later jail with prominent hipped roof and massive chimneys. The jail yards were functionally integral to the operation of the jails from their construction in 1869. The cells are lighted from the outside through heavy steel doors of vertical and steel bars. According to an account in the Owen Sound Times, April 12, 18, 1946, prisoners spent the large part of the day and all night locked in their cells. As there is no basement, it is likely that administrative functions, jailers' residence, kitchens, laundry and offices were located in the 1854 jail portion of the 19th century building after 1869. Documentary photographs of the use of the 1854 and 1869 jails are available and show the use of the 1854 jail as offices, kitchens, and service rooms up to 2011. The 1869 jail was used solely for prisoner accommodation on short and midterm basises from, the eight, from 1869 to 2011. Window locations originally on all four elevations of the 1869 jail are largely intact, with some now covered to use as doors for exit to fire stairs. Doors to the jail yards from the ground floor are still extant. The jail yards are prominent features as viewed from 4th Avenue East, with only the silhouette of the jail roof visible from the street. The jail interior is solidly built, but having been vacant for almost a decade, has suffered from moisture infiltration and environmental issues. The typical historic detail common to the stone jails of the period is still intact within the cell areas on the three floors, and the occupation of the cell block was much the same in the last decade as it had been in the 19th century. I will quickly go through a few images of the interior of the jail. The last building is the governor's residence, built in 1889 and adapted over time to suit both residential and pris prisoner handling purposes. 
It has deteriorated very substantially on both its interior and exterior, and because the finishes of the interior were primarily residential in nature, it is not likely to be able to be recovered. Here is one interior shot of the uh, governor's residence. It was joined to both the courthouse and in 1854 jail, and a number of outbuildings were added to it over time. Here it is seen from its rear elevation. Now we are going to look briefly at what the reasons are the city is considering removal of the jail and governor's residence in whole or in part. We must recognize that there are certain factors that are present at the site. The city owns both the courthouse and the jail and its associated features. They have set the preservation and adaptive reuse of the designated courthouse as the highest priority for preservation of the sites. The buildings have all been unoccupied for some time and interim measures with the community groups, with community groups and not-for-profits have not been sustainable given the size and condition of the structures. The city made repeated attempts to sell the properties containing the listed and designated structures and the adaptive reuse of the courthouse has in the past been encumbered by the present presence of the jail buildings and ancillary buildings on the site. The removal of some or all jail structures may make the property more viable and assure the preservation of the courthouse. The current condition of the buildings presents risk and maintenance costs are high for the city, given that the num there are a great number of buildings on the site and given the scale of the structures. We've looked at options and recommendations for presentation to the city. According to the Heritage Impact Assessment, the removal of all structures on the jail property would have significant impact on the integrity of the judicial precinct as an interconnected series of properties that can be defined as a historic place. The removal of the jail buildings would have significant impact on the cultural heritage value of the designated courthouse. The HIA assesses the impact of maintaining the site in its current condition with improvements prior to determining how to implement one of four options for site cleanup, remediation, and potential removal of one or more buildings on the jail property. When doing a conservation strategic plan, it is important to understand what the, what the conservation strategies are for the designated buildings and to consider all of them. In consideration of such a property, there are a number of uh, stages that we go through. In this project, we looked at retention and conservation of full interior and exterior buildings with adaptive reuse and compatible renovation. Retention in part of the buildings, full exterior, partial interior, or full exterior or its greater parts with removal of the interior for adaptive reuse and compatible renovation. Partial exterior retention and incorporation into a new suitable use with compatible approach to addition and alteration. Removal of the buildings and mitigation of removal and retention in its current site in a mothballed state. These are all ways of looking at heritage sites, which are recommended for consideration by the provincial and federal governments under their guidelines before actions are taken. We have to ask, how do we filter these alternatives, especially on a large complex site that has multiple buildings in vacant occupancy, also in a deteriorated state? There are many ways of evalu evaluating alternatives that are good for the historic place when difficult decisions may be made, must be made. You look at the priorities of preservation, the severity of impact and its scale of impact, whether an impact is permanent or temporary, reversible or irreversible, whether positive impacts can result from alteration or change to a site that are, um, that are in the long term best interests of the place. We look at the fact-based issues that are pre present a risk to the site in its future and how they can be mitigated. And we look at the federal and provincial guidelines 
um, in decision-making processes uh, and methodologies to ensure that our rationale follows those procedures. The options are as follows from low to high impact. Option one, remove the governor's residence and miscellaneous buildings, retain and conserve in, uh, the 1854 and 1869 jail and its jail yard walls. Option two, remove the governor's residence and the 1854 jail. The removal of these buildings from the property would have a higher overall impact to the cultural heritage value of the property, especially considering the age and intangible value of the 1854 jail. Option three, a high level impact. Remove the governor's residence, miscellaneous outbuildings, the 1854 jail, and all of, or some of the jail yard walls. The removal of the 1854 jail and the jail yard walls would have a negative impact on the cultural heritage value of the property. Option four, the highest impact, full removal of all jail buildings. Remove all the buildings from the property, including the jail yard walls. The removal of the 1869 jail in combination with the 54 jail and the jail yard walls would eliminate the cultural heritage value of the jail property and would have a negative effect on the heritage value of the adjacent courthouse site. Option five is the lowest impact, but is a temporary measure. That would be to create a viable holding pattern by retaining and maintaining through mothballing processes, all buildings on the site but to clean up the site and the interior of the buildings. These options are illustrated in the following four images, showing in blue the walls that would remain and in orange the areas that would relate to removal. Each of these options have been examined and will be evaluated further through investigation and preliminary costing. In this option one, the proposal would see the removal of the highly deteriorated governor's residence and outbuildings with stabilization of the courthouse. In this option, it is possible to imagine the sale of the property with the preservation of the courthouse as well as the historic jails. In option two, the governor's residence, outbuildings, and 1854 jail would be removed, leaving the courthouse and 1860s jail and jail yards intact. In option three, the removal of all structures uh, in option um, two would be um, would be achieved, plus the jail yard walls would be removed to open the site to further development while maintaining the stone jail. Option four is the most dramatic, showing the preservation of the courthouse only for adaptive reuse with all other structures removed. In each of these cases where removal was part of a future endeavor, a strategic conservation plan for commemoration and interpretation of the removed structures and spaces would be initiated. Option five is not shown, involving the temporary retention of all buildings in a holding pattern through mothballing. The HIA also outlines mitigation measures that are recommended if any one of the above mentioned options are selected. The HIA sets out a series of general recommendations, including further technical studies that are required. Next steps. The city is considering these options and the best course for preservation of the courthouse, including near and midterm actions to make the site more easily maintained and monitored, including removal of the designated substances and ancillary buildings, including the governor's residence and miscellaneous storage buildings. THA will be taking part in public consultation in the future in order to understand the public response and preferences for the jail property action plan and potential building removals. Our reports are available through the city's dedicated website on this courthouse and jail site. Thank you for your attention.